You're so excited and then you just get hit. Their baby's brain was outside her body. Our heart sank. And doctors told them to brace for the worst. He said, I've never seen a case like this make it to birth. Why they chose to keep their child. That was the time we came together and just made a decision. Battling hopelessness by becoming an optimist fit. Hope Generation founder and speaker Ben Corson is here to tell us how. That and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. The year was 1969, two months prior to the Apollo moon landing, and John Voight became a Hollywood star with the debut of his first major film. Voight's on-screen career spans nearly six decades, and he's still going strong. Recently, he sat down with Studio 5's Ephraim Graham to discuss his life and faith. Right, here we go, Mr. Voight. Quiet, please. We're all I don't like your terms. John Voigt is Mickey Donovan in the Showtime series Ray Donovan, Ray's rough and rugged father, released from prison after a 20-year stint. You're like Abraham, huh? Wanted to kill his son. God stopped him, said he shouldn't do that. Mickey is the latest in now a decades-long list of unforgettable acting roles Voigt's played, dating back to the 1960s. But you don't want to kill anybody here. He earned an Oscar playing Enough a paraplegic first. Vietnam veteran in the film Coming Home in 1978. And he's not slowing down. We caught up with him on yet another red carpet in Hollywood. What work are you most proud of? I guess that I, that I really have ex expressed myself at one point, learned enough to pursue the truth no matter where things fell. And that makes me stronger and uh, it makes me feel good that I have achieved that moment where I came to that understanding. At 80 years and counting, Voigt is a bit of a rarity in the city of Angels. He's a conservative and a vocal supporter of President Donald Trump. We celebrate and honor you because you're so outspoken about things like morality and your faith. What, what drives you to be so outspoken? As I've gotten older, I realized that, uh, uh, that there's only so many years left. When young people hear old people like myself saying life is short, they say, in their heads they're saying, what is he, nuts? <laughs> they say, I just want to get to, I want to get to be 18. They're going to get to be 18. Then they're, they're going to turn around at 24 and then they're going to be, you know what I mean? And then a, a tennis player and you're 30 and you say it's you're over the hill. Yeah. What? <laughs> but uh, life is, goes by quickly. It's very precious. And take advantage of the time you're here and use it for the purpose of what? Helping others, being of service to people. Each one of us has something to give. If you have a gift of some sort, and everyone does, everyone is a spiritual powerhouse. I've learned many lessons and made many mistakes, and sometimes you learn best from mistakes, unfortunately. You said you made some mistakes. What do you think is the biggest mistake you've made? And I say I, I, I had an affair and I, and, I, and I had a divorce. I, would, I wish I could go back and uh, not go through that either, either th adventure. I strove very hard to keep the family together, but that was such a, a crushing break that it, there was a lot of hurt involved. It, when it was my fault, I had to take responsibility for that and I had to learn from it. John Voigt is the father of celebrated actress and director Angelina Jolie and actor James Haven. Jolie was just one when her parents divorced. So I would recommend to people, don't be, don't, don't be so cavalier about breaking a marriage. If there are kids involved, don't do it. Listen to me, son. I gotta get this thing started, you stay here. And with his still thriving career and full family life, Voight has just one more thing he doesn't want to see people do. To lose the compass of God is the greatest crime and sadness. It is to lose that touch, you know, to be adrift without that touch. All right, Ashley, I'm, I'm older. <laughs> if I were to tell you life is very short, um, what, what's your reaction? I would say I agree. Hmm. Yeah, um, I feel like it was just yesterday I was 18 and now I'm in my 
mid 20s heading to 30. So, yeah, I mean, it goes, it really does go by fast. I do agree. Yeah, and what I, my experience is, the older you get, the faster it yeah. seems. Yeah. Uh, it seems to accelerate its pace, yeah. and and you kind of look back and say, what you know, what happened? Yeah. Do and you, then, do you agree that he's a he that he says most everyone is a spiritual powerhouse? Everyone has the spirit of God in them. Yeah. That's yeah. where we get it from. That's where we get life from. Uh, the Bible's very clear. God breathed into Adam, and he yeah. became a living soul. So if you're a living soul, that means you're a spiritual powerhouse because the breath of God is in you, yeah. uh, and it's how you use that. Mm -hmm. Do you use that for other people? And uh, one of, the, one of the, the sayings I learned, and I learned it from T.L. Osborne, the most spiritual thing you can ever do is to help somebody else. And to, so to hear John Voigt say, yeah. help other people, um, that's 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 the key, and if you if you do that, you do that consistently. Then when you're 60, like me, or 80, like John, you look back and say, okay, I've, I've done all right. Yeah, definitely. Well, if you guys want more entertainment news from Ephraim Graham, including his weekly top five, check out his show, Studio 5. You can watch it on the CBN News Channel or online at cbn.com slash Studio 5. Well, up next, author and speaker Ben Corson invites you on an epic adventure with God and the squad. He's here to talk about the group of people he calls the Optimisfits right after this. In high school, Ben Corson was voted student body president, won the homecoming crown, and was a star basketball player. But midway through his senior year, Ben became depressed and even battled thoughts of suicide. That is until he met an unlikely group of friends. Take a look. Ben Corson gave his first message in third grade, started a weekly home Bible study at age 16, and became a full-time pastor his senior year of high school. Today, he is the founder of Hope Generation, and the host of a global TV and national radio program. His YouTube videos have inspired people from every walk of life. In his book, Optimisfits, Ben shares his personal struggles with depression and anxiety, how he found a way through them, and offers a message of hope for everyone. Well, Ben Corson joins us now. Ben, thank you so much for being here. This is so fun. It's going to be it's so like, fun. I'm just enjoying this day, riding the wave. <laughs> this is exactly, great. exactly. Well, let's go back to that time. Um, I guess you were in, you were in high school yeah. when you started to feel depressed. Take us back to that. Kind of kind of walk us through that. Yeah. Well, when I was 18 years old, I became a pastor at a mega church. So wow. I was speaking to people who were three times my age. Yeah. So I felt this need to like present an image to the world that that wasn't who I am. Yeah. Like who I am by nature is a professional fun haver, live for a living. <laughs> yeah. You know what, I believe fun is fundamental. Jesus puts the fun back in funeral. He causes the dead to raise, the lame to leave, the yeah. blind to see, the mute to speak, the deaf to hear, mm -hmm. the lost to get found. But I felt like I needed to stifle that enthusiasm and be more of this like super somber, serious, sober saint. <laughs> and then, then I realized, you know what? I'm, a lot of my depression is coming from cognitive dissonance where I'm holding these con contradictory, oxymoronic, paradoxical beliefs where on one hand, I'm trying to please people. And on the other hand, I know who God really made me to be. Mm -hmm. So when I finally just cast off this um, idea that people are my dictionary, they define me. And I realized that's not true. Like yeah. Malachi 3.17 says, I'm a jewel to God. Mm -hmm. Then I just started being who I am and things got a lot better. Yeah, so would you say that is what got you through and break through the depression fog? Uh, that's one of the things. Another one, there's multiple, um, okay. one of them is is my friends. Yeah. So it wasn't some complex intervention. It wasn't some like seven hour conversation over coffee or lying on a, a, a psych psychiatrist couch, as great yeah. as all those things can be. Yeah, yeah. For me personally, this is just my experience. It was friends who didn't say a word about my struggle. They just grabbed their skateboards and showed me that life could be crazy and fun again. Wow. Like that, that really brought me out. That's awesome. And you talk about that there is often a misunderstanding of living with depression. What, yeah, what is that? I hate that for it. Like, you know, you know, I'm yeah. glad you brought that up because you know, when you hear fingernails down a chalkboard, yeah. it's like in vogue among hipsters and stuff to say, oh, I just live, live. I'm going to learn to live with depression as if that's a very wise thing to say. Mm. And I'm like, I'm unapologetic about saying that phrase is awful. We do not <laughs> live with depression. We defeat yeah. it. Amen. And what we need is an army that never quits. That's what our generation is going to go down as not the mope generation, the hope generation. And I figure for on this mode of dust hurtling through a sunbeam at 67,000 miles per hour, we might as well 
I'll change it while we're here. Yeah. We're not going to say, you know, with my short time here, I'm going to live with depression. I'm going to learn how to. No, we're going to defeat it and we're going to fight it. Yeah. And uh, we used to be scared of the dark, but now the dark's going to be scared of us. Ooh, okay. You're preaching let's this go. morning. You're preaching. You're <laughs> preaching. Well, let's talk about the title of the book, Optimist Fits. Where did that term even come from and yeah. what exactly does that mean? Well, if you put it into your like Word document, your spell check's going to go into spasms because it's yeah. not a real word. I've noticed. It's made up. It's made up. And my brother-in-law made it up. I'm like, I told my brother-in-law, Seth, I'm, I'm writing a book about rebellious hopefulness. Like people commit suicide once every 40 seconds in our culture around the world. So I want to rebel against the fact that our planet is sinking into despair. So he's like, perfect, optimistfits. So it just wow. means optimistic misfit. Somebody who lives as a non-conformist adventure mm -hmm. with wild abandonment, childlike wonder and sacred Jesus joy. And uh, yeah. that's what optimistfits is. I love it. I love it. Well, why do you think our culture and especially the younger generations, I mean, anxiety and depression is rampant. Why do you think that is? Well, it's increased by 25% nationally yeah. and the sociological data and research has clearly demonstrated that this is through social media. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is social media. So the same, um, dopamine loop that's triggered when you do drugs is triggered by by social media. When you get texts, likes, and notifications, when you hear the, the phone buzz, it produces the same chemical that gambling does in your brain. Wow. It's addictive because yeah. you don't, when you yeah. gamble, you don't know if you're going to win or you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. When you hear a notification, you don't know if it's good or bad. So it's addicting. So we pull out our phone once every six minutes, 150 times per day statistically. And so when we compare our behind the scenes with other people's highlight reels, uh, this, this comparison game is the thief of our joy. Definitely. Well, why, how can we nourish the rebel inside of us? You kind of talk about that. It's all about leading a rebellion and having hope. How can we nourish that inside well, of us? As young people, we have a desire to rebel. So instead of saying, you know, I'm just going to get hammered, like what if we instead harnessed our rebellion into a focused energy to make our spirit indomitable and we used it towards something life-giving mm -hmm. and and instead of like we have enough dope dealers in the world today we need more hope dealers yeah. and i say like let's use our rebellion towards something that's going to build rather than break definitely do you think the younger generations are stirring a revival yeah absolutely and yeah. joel and acts both foretold and prophesied of a day when young men would see visions, old men would dream dreams, maidens would prophesy the Spirit of God would fall um, upon all flesh. And I believe we're going to see a lot of Eeyores becoming Tiggers. I mean, we have enough people who tell it like it is. We need some more people who I tell it like that. it can be. And I think we're seeing that today. You're definitely one of those people. Well, what would you have to say to someone who's struggling with hopelessness? who's struggling with depression or anxiety, what would you have to say to them this morning? So your, your breakdown is somebody else's breakthrough and your, your scars, when you share them, they become stars. Like people are impressed by our accomplishments, but they, are, they connect with our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so um, you no longer have to just say, hear my words theoretically. You can say, touch my wounds, just as Jesus did physically in the story. So I feel like um, if you're going through depression, just remember that life is like a glow stick. Sometimes you got to break before you shine. I really do wow. believe that. And um, you might be at your rope's end, but you're never at your hope's end. So just relax yeah. and sit back because every setback will be a setup for a comeback because that's how our God works. That's so awesome. Well, where can people get more of the Optimist Fits and Hope Generation, your, your radio yeah. and TV? Talk about that. Yeah, so um, our TV show is on 12 networks in 180 countries. And then, yeah, you can get Optimist. It's anywhere books are sold. And you can find anything, at uh, all our stuff at just my website, bencourse.com. Or just type in Hope Generation to YouTube or Instagram or whatever. And that's where all our stuff is. Awesome. Well, yeah. Ben, thank you so much. The book is called Optimist Fits, Igniting a Fierce Rebellion Against Hopelessness. It's available, like he said, wherever books are sold. Gordon? Still ahead, a routine ultrasound reveals a baby with an open skull and an exposed brain. And I remember my husband saying, what are the chances that she's going to make it through this? So there's a percentage, give me a percentage, and he's like, none. See how their child beat those impossible odds next when we come back. When Sean and Sandy learned that their baby girl wasn't going to live past birth, they were advised to abort. Instead, the couple decided to pray and cling to a promise from God. Sandy Winger was six weeks into her first pregnancy when she says she heard God tell her her baby was a girl and to name her Zoe, which means life. 
And at that moment, I thought, she's just gonna have the God kind of life, you know, joyful. And I had no idea at the time what would unfold, you know, the following months. Sandy's husband, Shane, remembers at their 20-week ultrasound, the doctor said there was a problem. Zoe's skull had not closed, and 40% of her brain was outside the skull. They called it a posterior encephalocele, and he could see her skull and where it was open and, and where her brain began to grow outside of her head and the percentage was outside, um, our heart sank. And so I remember the tears just start to trickle, you know, down my face. And the same day, you're so excited, and then you just get hit. And I remember my husband saying, well, what are the chances of, of her surviving? What are the chances that she's gonna make it through this? And he said, in my 30-year profession, I've never seen a case like this make it to birth. And I think I asked again, like, okay, so there's a percentage, give me a percentage, and he's like, none. The doctor recommended they abort Zoe. Sandy and Shane decided otherwise. We're not gonna do it. We serve too big of a God. Life, whether it's in the womb for nine months or eight months, it's life and, and it's life that it's not ours to take away. And so we began to talk and we began just to share scriptures. We really believe that, that uh, Zoe means life. And we believe the enemy come to try to steal and try to take her potential, to take her life. And we're going to believe what God's Word says and that children are a blessing of the Lord. We had to have faith that God loves her even more than me and my wife combined, that He loves her more than we do. And so we put our faith and confidence in Him despite of what we felt, despite of what the doctor's opinion was or what his thoughts were. And so uh, that to us was the most critical time, I believe, because that was the time we came together and just made a decision. For months, they held on to hope and prayed for a miracle. Faith is the one thing that pleases God. And so our part is just simply to believe. Our part isn't to perform the miracle. There's nothing that we could do. There's nothing that the doctors could do. Remember what God spoke to me six weeks along? He knew her name would be Zoe for a reason. He knew that she would have life. He knew the outcome before we even knew the diagnosis or the problem. He knew everything that was gonna happen. And so we clung on to the fact that we knew what God had spoke, that He said she would have the God kind of life. And the God kind of life is joy and peace and life. And so I hung on to that word very tightly. Despite all odds, Zoe made it to term. During delivery, once more, their faith was put to the test. The first thing that I saw for Zoe, what I saw her, was her, was her brain, was her, I mean, there, there was no skull in the back of her head. It was, and so for me, um, that was really hard. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if she'd make it. I just remember. looking in that little incubator and she lifted her little head and I just knew you're gonna be fine and I didn't question in that moment whether she would continue to live what would happen just lifting up her little head and she was so perfect to me and so tiny and they had everything bandaged and covered, but I just knew God has huge plans for you. And I didn't know what it would be, everything that would happen in her life, but I knew she was the most beautiful baby I had ever laid my eyes on. And I couldn't wait to just pick her up and to hold her. Two days later, Zoe had surgery to remove brain matter and close the hole in her skull. And just five days later, she was released from the hospital. Shane and Sandy say God continued to answer prayers and provide healing and life beyond what anyone thought possible. Zoe absolutely is a blessing. She is one of the biggest joys of my life. 
She's nine years old today. She's full of life. She is full of energy. I thank God that, that we chose to believe and the people that we had surrounding us were people of faith. What a miracle she is and a testament of God's faithfulness and His goodness. What He says is true and His Word is true and He's not going to set you up for failure. Every day I'm healed and that's all my story. He's a good God. He wants to show His self big. He wants to do huge things. He's just looking for people who are willing to say, I trust you. And that's what he's looking for. He's looking for people to say, I trust you. Trust is another way to say faith, that you rely on God, you lean into him. When things are impossible, when doctors say there's no chance, well, with God, all things are possible. What is he looking for? Well, he's looking for people to agree with that and to agree together. And that's exactly what that wonderful couple did. They said, we, we come together, we come into agreement. Children are a blessing from the Lord. So we agree on that. That's what God's will says. That's what his word says. And so Sandy and Sean said, yes, I, I believe that. Uh, I'm going to hold to that. The doctors say abort, we say no. Children are a blessing and we're going to hold on to the promise. Do that. And here's a word for you. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the whole earth to show himself strong to those whose hearts are loyal to him. So all you have to do is say, my heart, I rely on God. And when you do that, he's looking for that. It pleases him when you have faith. So we're going to pray. Before we pray, we've got some prayer requests and Ashley's gonna share them with you. Yep, Tammy says, I need prayer for healing. My legs need to be restored so I can walk. I am scared and in a very dark place. Linda also says, I am still in pain on my left side and it's hard to go to the doctor when you can't afford health insurance. And another, uh, Linda actually has a praise request or praise report according to my son's test on Wednesday. His cancerous cells are decreasing. Breakthrough is coming. Praises to God. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's lift these to the Lord. And all we have to do is just believe and just do that. Uh, don't look at the report any longer. Look to God and start realizing how great he is. Uh, don't look at the report and realize how great the report is. Look to God. He is the author and finisher of your faith. And with him, all things are possible. So just Tell your report how big your God is and let him do everything for you. Let's pray. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you. We pray especially for Tammy that her legs would be healed now in Jesus' name. We pray for Linda in this doctor's report and we just break that report and we believe your report. And your report says that all our iniquities are forgiven. They're all taken away and all our diseases are healed. And so we just hold that right now. And we say to everyone needing healing now, be healed now in Jesus name. Fevers go away, infections go away, inflammation go away, cancer go away be restored and be in full and perfect health in the name of Jesus. Ashley, God just gave you some. Yeah, um, anyone with Crohn's disease, any type of autoimmune disorders, flee in the name of Jesus. The darkness flees in the name of Jesus and bows at the name of Jesus. So receive your healing for any autoimmune disorder that has no cure. We rebuke it in Jesus' name. Receive the peace of God and the healing of God in Jesus name. And someone you got scarring on your liver related to an infection and God is just healing your liver. He's restoring your liver enzymes. Go back and get retested and realize that you're infection free, you're scar free. It's, it's like he's given you a brand new organ. God is healing you right now. Someone else with severe infection in your throat and uh, you, you can't even speak and God is just restoring everything to you right now. In Jesus name, he's able to even restore vocal cords. What has been damaged is now healed and now restored in Jesus name. 
Yeah, people with stomach issues, esophageal issues, just receive your healing. God's going to heal you in Jesus' mighty name. Receive it. There are several people, you've got arthritis in your hands, and it's just difficult for you from, to move your fingers. God has healed all of that now. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been healed, share your good report. Let us know. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from James. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The affected, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much.